think about themselves, about life and things in general. Because music is not simply entertainment. Classical music in particular is a composition which is, enables us to enrich the capabilities of the human mind. And that the, the mastery of this is therefore relevant to all human beings, potentially at least, that the learning how to use your mind properly, the way it was intended to be used, is the purpose here. And if that, with that in mind, this is not just music. It's more than just music. It's the principle of the human mind. And uh, we hope that you will take away from this experience some inkling of that and also be devoted to, to uh, pursuing this matter further. Let me just add to what you said. We're going to be looking at Bach, but Bach also doesn't come out of nowhere. Bach comes out of a, content, a direct uh, continuity, a direct line that stems from the Renaissance with Nicholas of Cusa through Kepler up to Bach and then beyond. And we're going to start to touch a little bit on the beyond just today. What Cusa did is establish, as you're saying, that the location and the presence of the human mind in human mental experience, which is of the category of discovery and access to principle, he locates this outside of the senses and makes a truthful declaration of this as the basis of human society and human existence as opposed to every other species on the planet. Kepler applies what Cusa discovered and declared, applies it and validates it as the method for making discoveries of physical principles in science. Now, in the context and in the process of doing that, Kepler also opens the door for what we see in Bach, which is a complete revolution in the musical language. And the place he does that is in his discovery of universal gravitation by using the language of polyphonic harmonics to be able to locate the motions of the, different, the, the multitude of planets of the solar system as a single unified system. And answer the question, not, uh, answer the question why do we have these, this particular set of motions of the different planets moved by the sun and not some other set? Now, what comes out of this in, in, uh, is that Kepler actually changes the meaning of harmonics. And he takes the harmonic intervals, which exist in music and had been studied from the time of the Greeks, if not before, as mathematical values, as direct mathematical arithmetical proportions. And Kepler establishes a new set of harmonics which are not, or which are not fixed mathematical proportions. And if people look back at his work, what he finds in the harmonic ratios of the motions of the planets are not these arithmetical harmonies. They're slightly larger, they're slightly smaller, and they're changing. They're constantly adjusting and changing. So this means, number one, sound is not something which, and harmonic sound in particular, that language is not something which stems from arithmetic and mathematical values from the bottom up. It stems from the mind down. Because the place that these planetary harmonics originates from is the singleness of action and idea of the mover, of the sun. And every motion taking place in the solar system is, an, is not some point-to-point -point interaction. It's an expression of the unity of effect of the action of the sun. Now this opens the door, as I said, for Bach, who opens a complete revolution in music and the musical language and takes what had been declared by Cusa experienced and applied by Kepler and validated, what Bach begins to do by making this the basis of, of the musical language is he begins to generalize this principle. as a, a, He begins to make this a general method of human communication and human experience through music. Now, this was actually expressed very beautifully by uh, the first biographer of Bach, Nicholas Forkel, who was very close to the, working very closely with the Bach family. And his description of the way that Bach invented his harmonic intervals, or he describes it as Bach's harmonies, or that Bach never started from sound. And the, the typical method beforehand was to have either a melody or maybe a bass line, a melody in the bass voice, and then to harmonize point to point sounds over that, which would either sound good or maybe you have a pass to a dissonance and then you resolve to something which sounds harmonic again. The way Forkel describes it is that that's not the way Bach composed. The way Bach composed is by the creation of three, four, five, and, and sometimes more, independent voices, 
which were making, and he describes it with this beautiful image of independent personalities, which were equally well informed on the topic of discussion and which interact and discuss with each other. And the, what's formed in between them in the counterpoint of these different statements of an idea is a unity. And that Bach's harmonies and method of composition comes out of this. Now, this was studied intensely by the people coming out of the culture of Bach. And we're, what we're going to start with is Mozart. Mozart, in 1782, I think it is, arrives in Vienna as a young man, 25, 26 years old. Now, Mozart's coming from a very musical family. He's already a, a, an established composer. He had been a child prodigy, very well known. Mozart, when he gets, arrives at Vienna, is brought into the salon of Baron von Sweeten, who had been the ambassador at Potsdam in Berlin, had talked and known the, the king there, had known C.P.E. Bach, and had been collecting these manuscripts of Bach's works, particularly Bach's fugues, and then, at this point, bringing them back to Vienna, which was the center of musical culture in Europe at the time. And Mozart's invited into these Sunday salons once a week, where he had an intensive study of young musicians around Baron von Sweden, including Mozart and Haydn, who's a little older, of the fugues of Bach. And this revolutionizes Mozart's compositions. Revo it, it, it puts him through a certain revolutionary experience of the mind, out of which you have a complete transformation in his own already beautiful compositions. So what he does, uh, what, one thing they do during these salons is they take the fugues from the well-tempered clavier, which we studied last week, mm -hmm. began to study last week. Mozart takes the principle which is implicit in Bach, commented on by Forkel, of the independence of the voices and counterpoint with one another. And he, act, he makes that explicit by setting the fugue, which had been, been written for keyboard, as a piece for a string quartet. And they use this in the salon as an object of experimentation and study to pull this apart and find out what is this principle in here. So uh, what I'd like to do is begin by, what, what I'd like to do as the, as the example to explore today is I want to use the same fugue that we used last week, which is the fugue in C minor from the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. So what I'll do now is just start by playing the very opening of the keyboard version of that so we can have it in our heads. Now what I'll play is I'll play, that, the, I'll play the theme that we just heard as it's sung by the violin, the voice of the violin. So that I'll play the violin, and then after that I'll play the cello. So we can now hear the transformation that happens by adding the dimensionalities of the string medium. So now what's implicit in Bach's mind when he composes the keyboard is we, we literally have now different personalities, not only in the colors of the instruments, but also in the personalities and individuality of the different individual musicians mm -hmm. involved. Now what I want to do is I want to get into what, begin to touch what are some of the characteristics of this musical language? What are the, what is the kind of mental experience which is accessible to Mozart? which he would have been studying with these fugues. So in order to do that, I'm actually going to start at the end. And um, what I'm going to play now, I'm going to play something which probably won't mean very much to you yet, but which will. <laughs> Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> now, what we're going to do now is I'm going to now tr we're going to go back to the beginning, and we're going to trace from that from the beginning up through this point, and hopefully this will actually mean something to you by the time we get we return back to it in the future. Um, so let me just do this. Let me just play the very beginning of the fugue with the strings. And what, um, what people should listen for is, pe is people should listen for this theme that we've now heard a couple of times. You'll hear it first in the second violin, then the first violin, then the viola, then the cello. So just listen for how this, this statement of the theme is passed around to these different individuals and put into the mouths of the different characters of the dialogue. Obviously, hopefully the theme was audible as it was passed around, but that's obviously not all that was occurring. So now I want to look a little bit at what are the other elements that are, that are being put before us now. So if um, we can see in measure 8 that we have the entrance, and I'll, I'll play this in a moment, we have the entrance of the theme again in the, upper, the first violin, the uppermost voice. And when I'll play it, you'll, you'll recognize it as the theme for the most part. It's a little bit changed, but it's recognizable. Now I'm going to play that with what it is placed in counterpoint with. So I'll play it one more time, and people should, what I want people to hear is that your ears are hearing the same notes as before and the same theme, but it's changed. Now some, it's, there's been something new introduced, and, and the meaning of it is now changed. The mind is hearing a different meaning now because of what it's placed in dialogue and counterpoint with. All right. Now it's it's these two elements basically that I've pointed out. Number one, we have the the exchange of the theme and the passing of the theme from personality to personality, which establishes a certain rate of change occurring as the process unfolds. We have this element, and then we have the other element of how that theme in itself is being changed inside the mind by this process of counterpoint of its interaction with, with another idea and the resolution of that interaction in the mind. So what I'll play now is I'll play uh, the beginning up through uh, about the halfway point of the piece where Bach, using these elements, brings, brings the process to a first conclusion. Actually, we're not going to start at the beginning. We're going to start just a little bit before this and then bring it to its first conclusion.
So you heard the last note, you have the, the conclusion of every, the everything closes and unifies and resolves on G. Yeah. In G, which is a, a fifth above where we started the key of C minor, which is the, the home base of the entire fugue. That's a first conclusion. But then Bach starts again, and we have a new beginning. So I'll just play that new beginning, and it's, what, what you'll hear right away is that we, we have a new, a new opening, but there's something immediately different about it. So let's look a little bit at what's happening here. We have a, a first statement again, the first theme, just as the piece opened before, but now an octave higher, which is then immediately followed by another restatement of the theme in the viola voice, which is then followed by another restatement of the theme in the second violin, and then the first violin, and then the viola, and then the violin again. So what, I, what I'll play now is I'll play that separated out so that we can hear clearly this exchange which is happening of the theme. So I find this really delightful because all, with, as, suddenly in the retake of the theme, in the new beginning, we have a, a changed geometry where uh, the first two times you hear the theme, there's already a change. And we see this in the viola voice where the violin makes the theme statement then the viola voice makes the theme statement, but in inversion, where rather than falling, the viola voice rises. So I'll just play that by itself. which is quite delightful because this is the only time that we actually hear the inversion of the theme until the very end where it plays a crucial role. So now if we go back to, uh, to the, the four voices together, um, we, have the, uh, we have this exchange of the theme which is happening, number one, at a faster rate than it happened before. But number two, already by the third measure, that quicker rate of, of action has now become even quicker. And so what we hear in the second violin, passed to the first violin, passed to the viola, and so on, is the theme, but it's only the first four notes of the theme. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll play that again so that people can hear it. What before was you know something like eight notes, which took an entire measure, is now being passed around just in the first four notes of the theme. So we have an acceleration of the action, an acceleration of the change at the same time that there's transformation occurring. But what he also, so, so we have a speeding up of the time, of the tempo, but at the same time, he also does, he also adds a stretching out of the tempo in counterpoint to all of that. So what I'll do is, um, you can see it if you go, yeah, the, the blue notes there in the second violin voice. So I'll play it and people should be able to hear what I'm talking about.
Now, just a, a note on what he's doing in the, in the third and fourth and fifth measures here, where the theme has now been compressed to now just four notes. And it's, it's crucial to think about the fact that what your ears are hearing now are just these four notes. But what the mind is experiencing at that time is this whole, is the entire theme. And so the development process has gotten to a point where we actually require less sound to represent a more complex developing idea. And you're literally having the movement of the mind away from the experience of the ears and more and more to the kind of complex experience of the ideas above the sounds. So keep that in mind because this is what he, this is what, this point we've arrived at now is what Bach uses to develop up until the end. So we're going to go now to, um, we're going to go now back toward the end. Those elements Bach uses to develop the composition to another resolution. And now he resolves it back into C minor, which is the, the place we started from. But he doesn't quite leave it there. He has that conclusion, and then he has another, a third and final beginning of the piece. So I'll just play that. And uh, as, I, as I play it, what, I'm, what I'll point out here is that just as before, we had the theme which was condensed or compressed in a sense mentally into these four notes now. Now you have the wrapping up of everything that's come before into just two notes. And what you'll hear here, what, what I'll play um, separated out so that it's audible, is you'll hear this exchange of the first two notes of the theme passed from character to character. And so rather than an entire statement of the theme or four notes of the theme, now we have two notes or really just one descending interval. So I can play that one more time. So now what I'd like to play is I'd like to play, I don't know if, if it's recognizable or not, but what this part is, this is what I played in the beginning, which I said people wouldn't understand yet, but we would get to. So maybe some recognize it, some didn't. But what I'd like to do is now just play, uh, play the clip that I played at the very beginning, and, and you should be able to hear these things in it. Aha. Uh -huh. Now what did the cello do there? Because the, in this retake of the theme we have this is characterized by these descending this descending interval, but the cello didn't do that. The cello did this. Which is this wonderful intervention. So you have the intervention of the cello in what's really kind of a final, you know, a finalizing statement on the whole thing, which inverts everything. All the other voices had been entering on this descending interval. The cello enters on, number one, the inversion, which we had heard before. And number two starts off with a rising half step. Now what Bach does is he takes this entire process that we've been going through, this, this wrapping up of the theme into these denser and denser intervals and denser and denser rate of change. Just a couple measures before this, he had wrapped it up into just two notes. Now already he's wrapping it up into one rising half step. 
And what I'm going to play now is I'm just going to play, I'll play the ce what the cello does here, and then I'll play the answer of all of the other voices to that, which comes just in the next measure. I'll play that one more time. So what you hear is you hear this completely dense, compressed into one measure series of these rising half steps, which now for the mind, the ears are hearing this completely dense series of, of two notes in these rising half steps. The mind is hearing this entire process of transformation. So now what I'd like to play is I'm, I'm just going to play where we started before, just a few measures before this, with this third beginning all the way up until the end. I mean, just a couple things I'll emphasize before I, I pass it off here is, number one, this method of composition is, is, is completely freeing the mind from the language of the senses and literal statements. And you literally have the creation in the mind of a process which the ears cannot literally participate in, but which we can actually feel is what's, what's above the, what, what can be unfolded to the senses and which is organizing and driving the ironies which can be presented via the senses in this process of the development of mind. Now you had, as I said before, you had Mozart, you had Haydn. Later you had the young Beethoven come to Vienna and participate in these salons and the study of the well-tempered clavier and the fugues of Bach. And so what we had at the, the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the ninth, and up through the, the, the 19th century, is we had an absolute continuity of geniuses who were taking the, the line of Cusa through Kepler and developing it as a general characteristic of human language and common human experience. And the significance of the medium of the string quartet is that not only are you, you having a solo player which is participating in this, but you're actually having this become a, a medium of communication among multiple human beings at once, being animated by a single process at once as a unity. Um, so, and this, I mean, this is carried on, and I would just emphasize that what what you said in the beginning, Lynn, that this is not a question of, of music as music, as some branch of study, but we really are getting at uh, the development of the human mind. And you see that what was unleashed by Kuza was carried up to a certain point before it was attacked. And, and that's really, I think, where it, it's, it's crucial, it's existential that humanity is able to pick up that thread again today, given the challenges we face before us.